Okie doke. This is Quick Fix Golf on our regular Wednesday night meeting at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we speak with some of the leaders of the golf industry and some of the maniacs that actually listen in and ask their questions. And we have tonight a very distinguished guest with Jennifer Monroe, who is the creator of Golf Mind RX. And uh, welcome, to, welcome to our gang here, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. We have such a lovely Thank lady tonight. We, we want to make sure we, we, we watch our mouth tonight, you guys. <laughs> I know what this group is really like. I, I don't mind being one of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just introduce a little bit of you to them to say you took up golf in 1994, right? And uh, 19, yeah, 1995. Mm -hmm. And you and you Very were. Late. You were doing all kinds of, of uh, exercises, mental exercises and stuff for employees of companies, correct? No, I, I was a uh, corporate consultant um, improving performance and worked with over a thousand corporations. So what happened was I went on a golf outing. I've never played golf. Um, I went on a golf outing and um, had a fabulous day, my first day, and I got addicted. So I started telling all of my clients all around the country, if they would take me to play golf. Of course, I bought everything on every infomercial that came up, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, wherever I was in the country. But I told them if they would take me to play golf, I'd give them a discount on my fees. And so a lot of them did. And it was great. And so when they took me to play golf, they would take maybe two foursomes of executives or whatever. So I got to where I could you know, I did profiles, I've been doing profiles um, for performance purposes for 37 years. So I got to where I could kind of predict what somebody was going to do on the golf course just by watching them and knowing their profile. Um, I could predict when they were going to do well, when they were going to recover, when they weren't going to recover. And I could kind of predict what was going to set them off or get them off track. And so in 1999, somebody said, could you write a golf profile? And I said, I think so. So I did. Uh, so I wrote Golf Mind RX, um, put it on the web. At the time, the web wasn't what it is now. About 2003 it was much better. And so people, amateurs, could go online and take a golf profile to help amateurs play their best golf whenever, every time they got a chance to play, because amateurs can't play very often. So um, in that process, I met Peter Jacobson. He was my first uh, touring pro that never worked with me. Um, it was a little scary. I didn't want to ruin his game, but he won the U.S. Hartford Open three weeks after I met him. So he started sending me all kinds of touring pros. And so I ended up working for Golf Digest School as a corporate development person. And then I had the honor of working with Julie Inkster in 2015 and 2017 with the Solheim Cup. So here I was, corporate outing, never played golf, and love it, love it, love it, and I'm up to my ears in golf now. So who would have thought? Terrific. Let me see. I got some of those stuff. You wrote Golf Mind X. And golf it's Mind a, RX. It's like a RX. prescription for your golf mind. And it's a profile <laughs> for amateurs to help them overcome the obstacles that hold them back from good performance. Yes, but it turned out to work for touring pros, too. Really? Golfers of all levels, yes. So I work with some very nice touring pros. Uh, and Jennifer, you say you had four profiles? Four, no, no, I didn't say four profiles. No, I wrote, I've been, uh, the golf, there is a golf profile, which I wrote, and then there's a profile I use in my Eagle Vision Performance Solutions, which is my corporate business. Um, what, what so I, mean I still is, have the corporate business. Do you, do you categorize golfers into ca uh, into um, you know specific categories? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. So how many of those do you have? Well, there there are no two alike. So nobody is one trait. We're all a combination of those traits. Now, on the golf mind profile, to make it simple for somebody who's not been exposed to this before. We start with their highest trait, the primary trait, and we identify them by that. And I color code those. Uh, I've done that um, my whole career because people tend to remember the color that they are more than they remember the name of the golfer. So, um, so yes, there are four essential uh, components of personality 
four chunks of personality, um, main traits, but it's the unique combination that makes each individual unique. In other words, we don't have ever two, two profiles exactly the same. So, um, but all we have to really know to really have a good handle on why we do what we do or understand why somebody else does why they do um, and what kind of decisions and what happens to them is if we just know the top one, the, the highest one, that is the motivator for about 85% of their decisions. So you don't have to know everything and all the complexities of the uniqueness of the personality to understand yourself or understand somebody else, but knowing the number one, you know, top motivating trait uh, is a really good start. So I, there are four of those. Well, Jennifer, I have, I have, you can't see the screen, so I'm going to play. Right now I have the Challenger Red Golfer on the screen. Right, okay. So you can mm -hmm. explain that when the center trait of this temperament is dominance, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, well, the Challenger, well, first of all, let me just uh, summarize. Each trait has a driving force behind it. In other words, the brain is hardwired pretty much at birth to uh, take in information and evaluate it and judge it and um, assess it and make decisions on it based on that motivating factor. And, and we're all different. In the case of the challenger, or what we would call in the business world, we call them um, the driver, this is a very goal-driven personality. So virtually everything they do um, in their, their life, including their golf, is goal-driven. Now, you may think, well, aren't all golfers goal-driven? No, they are not. They are driven by other motiv uh, motivations. But the, the challenger golfer is driven by goals and driven by winning. The challenger really wants to win. And you think, well, don't all golfers want to win? Well, they do want to win, but they want other things more than that. So in the challenger's case, about 10% of the population, maybe not that high on the touring, uh, on the touring pro side, but, um, but that 10%, every decision they make, all the judgments, all the evaluations, uh, playing golf or working or whatever, it's always related to their goals. If it's not related to their goals, they kind of disregard it. It doesn't get, it doesn't get, um, uh, it doesn't count in the equation, really. So the central guiding force for them is always, um, you know, they want to do their personal best. They compete against themselves. They are very competitive, uh, but they're always goals-driven. All right, so then we move on to the blue. Well, so the blue we would call the social golfer. That doesn't mean, you know, when I say to somebody who's on the tour, and there are some really good players who are blues on the tour. Um, their highest trait is extroversion. Now, remember, every person has some of all the traits. We're just looking at, uh, for general understanding, what is the predominant trait. So the predominant trait for the um, social golfer, um, we would call that a relationship-driven person in the business, uh, business world. But a social golfer really is motivated by relationships and having positive relationships. So they are very easily distracted on the golf course if there's a lot of negative stuff going on. So when we talk to uh, social touring pros, they will always admit that they play their best golf and enjoy themselves the most when they're playing with their friends. And it's very hard for them to rein in their personality and suppress their normal outgoingness uh, to fit in to the people they're paired with and the other people on the tour. The tour is an awkward place for social golfers. Lee Trevino would be a social golfer, for instance. Matt Kuchar is a social golfer. So, so they really find themselves, whenever you find yourself having to be somebody you're not, suppressing something really natural to you, uh, not having the fun you would like to have even on the competitive round, uh, it affects your play. So, uh, so that's about 20% of the population. Now, are you sure about uh, Lee Trevino? Because it seemed like nobody liked him. Well, but he was very, the reason he didn't like him was because he was so noisy. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you know, it, it unnerved. It unnerved people. Peter Jacobson, who happens to be a very strong uh, challenger golfer, but his second trait is the, um, you know, he's got the secondary trait equal to that of the social. Mm-hmm. And the thing that always bothered Peter was the, you know, the negativity that he picked up from people when he was having fun with the gallery or he was having fun with his caddy. You know, it, it, same thing with Trevino. The others, the touring pros, resented it. They didn't, it, it unnerved them. All right. I, 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 I can buy that. Go ahead. Let me see. Let, let, I have yellow, yellow golfer. Okay. So we call the yellow golfer, this, that is a security-driven pro- personality trait. So it's driven to avoid conflict and it's driven to avoid um, embarrassment. It doesn't like to change things. But most of the people on the tour, um, men and women, are in this category. We call them traditional golfers. And so um, they are usually not very outgoing. They're usually very private. And, And remember, each person has more than one trait. So some of these traditionals will also have a high technical trait or they'll have a high people trait, the the blue, the extroversion, or they'll have maybe even some of the challenger. But if the traditional is the highest uh, trait, it means that they really are uncomfortable with anything that is not routine for them, that that is um, unexpected. They don't like to make changes in the middle of the year. They don't like to change equipment. They don't like to change um, technique. You know, they want to groove something um, they really do prefer practicing um, to competing. So, you know, they can sit on the driving range forever and hit fabulous, beautiful golf balls. Um, but they really, um, you know, they, it's harder for them in the actual competitive part of the round. They feel more pressure. And they also um, feel the more time pressure they feel, the slower they play. And so that makes the faster golfers play faster and they play slower and it's bad for both of them. Mm -hmm. And then we have, of course, the last but not least, green. Yeah, the green. Well, the green uh, is a technical golfer. And um, the more technical a person is, and we call this in the business world, we would call them the certainty-driven Uh, meaning that everything they do, they're looking for certainty, predictability. Um, They want the system, the process, the technique, that if they can just master that, uh, everything will be perfect. They're perfectionists. Uh, So a lot of times, the higher the technical um, trait, the less feel the golfer has. Um, So they can get, you know, they can, um, their brain... Um, can master very strong, complex information, a lot of complex information. I just spoke to one um, this week, and he said that he has every note, every notebook, every journal, every lesson that he's ever taken. His father was a touring pro. Uh, He was on the Futures Tour at one point. Um, But he said he's got a chest full and he goes and he reads all of that stuff (laughs) I said does that do you any good he said no he's had the yips for three years right so so the point of it is they they keep thinking if I just see enough videos and take enough lessons read enough books and master this and drill this and drill this and drill this it'll all work for me but what happens is they lose feel it's very hard to be thinking technical thoughts and feeling the swing at the same time so this is an engineer so, mind. Well, it, well, some engineers are traditionals and some are technicals. But, but the thing about it is, I, you know, I just um, bring this one person to mind. I'm not going to tell you your name. He's, he's pretty famous. but um, He's not on the tour anymore. But he was number one in the world at one time. And the reporter asked him, how, how does it feel to be number one in the world? And he said, you just don't know how bad the good times make you feel. And so the minute he started winning, he started worrying and not sleeping about the next time he's going to lose. And so that technical drive to be, a, be perfect, to master it, to never make a mistake, 
uh, they're so self-critical. It's very hard for them to maintain uh, a real winning streak. There's only there's only a handful on the tour that have ever really won much of anything. It was David Duvall you just described. <clears throat> it was uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, he did. He did say that. In a, <laughs> yeah, no, so you remember that, right? There you. Yeah. Darren, there you. You can't fool Darren. I mean, Darren is well, like, you know he's 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 in on all the action. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, and, and but you can see. I mean, like I said, I uh, I had a beautiful junior golfer, 16 years old, whose uh, father uh sold everything he owned in India to bring her over here so she could be on the tour and support the whole family. He's still and she's a technical. Uh, yeah, well, it, it broke it, it broke her heart because um the first time I I I don't ever talk to them without the parents on phone or whatever. And the first time I uh, spoke with her I said, um why would you tell me why you play golf? And she said what do you mean? I said, do, why do you play golf? Do you play golf because you love it? Do you play golf because you just happen to have a wonderful talent? Or do you play golf for some other reason? And she says, I play golf because my father makes me. Oh, boy. So, so, so that's what happens. You know, that's why I say personality, you know, personality matters. You know, I, um, it matters in everything. And it matters in why we play golf. It matters in how we parent. It matters in how we vote. It matters in how we judge things, how we make decisions. And we think we're so logical. But all these decisions and assessments come from that inner drive, whether you're driven to goals or you're driven to relationships or you're driven to security or you're driven to certainty. And um, if you're driven to the wrong things, um, and you're not ever compatible with where you are, that's where we get a lot of depression. You know, 400 million people have prescriptions for antidepressants. We only have 330 million people in this country, so a lot of them have more than one. And it's, prim it's primarily from um, not being comfortable, being able to be who you are most of the time. And we do that to kids all the time. Well, too bad that little girl wasn't from Cuba. She wouldn't have to worry. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody knows who their parents are over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she, she's, um, she's never done anything since then. So, well, well, I have on the screen um, right now your general information fill-out form to get an analysis. In case anybody has interest in getting an analysis, you fill this out, I guess. Put in your credit card information for ninety-nine bucks. You have a, or do you have a promo code you could give out tonight? Well, I really don't, but I tell you that $99 includes a phone call with me. Oh, wow. So, um, so once they do that and, um, and they have their report, uh, then they can call me. We can set up a time to talk, and I'll spend an hour, a couple of hours with them on the phone, uh, giving them specific applications to their golf game. Wow. So just go to golfmindrx.com. And look around for the yeah. take take the analysis now. Now you also have a book or something. Where's the book? I couldn't find the book on your site. I do I do have a book. It came out the day before Thanksgiving. It's and it, guess what? It's called Personality Matters with a big period at the end of that because that's really all you need to say. Personality matters, and it happens to be um, about for entrepreneurial thinkers. So it's about maintaining the fire and passion of entrepreneurial thinking. But it is a book about all the different profiles and how they impact each other. You know, Socrates says, you know, the, the um, truth of wisdom is knowing yourself, right? You have to know yourself first. And so personality really matters in knowing who you are. And then you can't really know somebody else until you know yourself. So this book gives you the insight into who you are and then who everybody else is and and what the predictable outcomes are, the, the, predict the predictable dynamics of that. So, um, but it's also got some golf stories in it. So. Yeah, where do you get the book? How can, how can they get the book if they wanted to do that? Well, thank you for asking. Amazon um, All right. has got it. Uh, Audible, if you want to listen, or iTunes, if you want to listen, and also Kindle. Terrific. You just Google, you just go in. 
personality matters, it'll pop right up. Got a big bonfire on the front to get your attention. <laughs> we got a couple of questions already. Let's 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 throw some of these at you real quick, and then I'm going to open up the microphones to see if somebody says, me, uh, let me see. Can you move from one trait to another based on the shot or the situation? Well, you're not going to ever change your trait. You can suppress a trait. In other words, say you have somebody, say you, say you are a very feeling um, golfer and you have a very technical instructor. You're going to try very, very hard to suppress your natural inclinations, your natural feelings to please that technical instructor because you, you know, you have faith in him and so forth. So you can behave more like a technical, but it won't work out very well. It won't feel right and it won't work right. One of the um, things, Bobby, you and I discussed a long time ago when I did the, um, the corporate development stuff for Golf Digest School was um, why you're, what you do is so fascinating and so fabulous and everybody ought to understand um, that this is really way, the way to learn. But the writers sat down with me one day and they said, how do you know when you have a good instructor? Because I hired the instructors. And I had a certain profile uh, I hired and really it had to do with having some people skills. I thought you should have some people skills. So um, it wasn't, you know, high expectations. I just wanted some people skills. So they said, how do you know when you have a good instructor? And I said, because the student gets better. And every writer looked at me and they said, no, really, how do you know? Well, I thought that was odd, you know, because I would think, <laughs> you know, you would expect the student to get better. But then I sat there and I listened to some of the existing you know, I did profiles on over 800 golf instructors, and uh, and I found only eight out of 800 that really, truly could relate to the way the student learned and could adapt his teaching so that the student got the best out of it. And um, and that was a shock to me because you know when you have that PGA certification, you expect them to know what they're doing, right? So. Um, so it's important that people understand that if they're not getting better, uh, if they're not playing better as soon as they meet that instructor, it doesn't mean they do it every day, it doesn't mean they don't lap back, but if they don't hit the best balls they've ever hit, they've got the wrong instructor. Here's another question here from uh, Paul Belmont. That You know, what you said there is, I remember that, I remember us discussing that, and that's, that's so true. Isn't that, isn't that right there? I mean, we think... Our, our main concern is, can we get this person to play better golf? And if you overload them with a whole lot of techno gumbo that, you know, maybe we know as golf pros, but can't really help the average player play any better, you're not doing them any good. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Bobby. <clears throat> and and um, it's one of the things that I'm always um, trying to figure out when I meet a student for the first time. You know, uh, Jennifer, I, I spend a lot of time around Michael Breed. And, um, you know, the psychology of giving a lesson, the psychology of understanding how a person learns, the psychology of understanding, you know, what, what type of person that they are is going to affect um, how the information is given and how, how they're, they're going to interpret it. So it's a really important thing, and most golf professionals are not understanding that. They don't get it. And they're not taught that. That when I went through PGA school, nobody taught me uh, about these four different types. You know, I've got four different types mm -hmm. that I use that are very similar to yours. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. But no PGA mm -hmm. professionals understand that. They don't. Uh, there's very well, they few. don't. They, well, but, but, you know, remember now. You, you know, Darren, this is the important thing to remember about anything, whether you hire an accountant or a lawyer or a dentist or whatever else that that person is driven by one of those motivations too. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, one of the things we encountered when we first got to Golf Digest School was most of their instructors were high technical instructors, okay? Well, the personality of a highly technical person, um, because they're so perfectionist driven and because um, they're so self-critical, they cannot be wrong, okay? So if you're learning from an instructor that cannot be wrong, 
has to be right, who do you think has to be wrong? Yeah. The yep. student. The student has to be wrong, right? And yep. so, um, so when we, you know, and the other thing is, there, there's some simple things. For instance, you know, I work with U.S. Kids Golf, and I just did a, a big thing down in uh, for level three certification for first tee in Miami. And um, and the things that they know, I mean, they've learned this stuff, is that, for instance, if you have a group of people, eight or ten people or six people or whatever, we're talking about the extroversion trait, okay? Extroverts unnerve introverts. So if you have, you know, if you're, you know you've seen this in a group of people, you're instructing them, and every time you say something, the real outgoing extrovert will answer you, and they'll tell you a story about it. And the rest of the group is saying, why don't they shut up, you know? Um, because, you know, but, that, but see, that extrovert feels that if they don't answer you or, or participate, you're going to feel bad. It's going to hurt your feelings. So, so they just jump right in, and they dominate. And so, um, so the introverts will shut down. You know, just about the time they want to ask a question, the extrovert tells the story. So, uh, and that's okay. But like if you separate the extroverts from the introverts, the introverts can hear you and the, ex and the extroverts can talk to themselves and talk to you. But when you mix them up, they unnerve each other because the extroverts feel like somehow these other people don't like them and the introverts feel like they never get a word in. And so with kids, this is especially uh, good to know, you know, because, um, you know, the kids are not as good at communicating, you know, what's bothering them. The other thing is um, the slow versus the fast, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the worst thing that can happen in golf is to be a, behind a slow group if you're fast or be um, have a fast group behind you if you're slow. And, of course, everybody always thinks they're just right that everybody has that, that um, patience trait versus the urgency trait, the yellow versus the non-yellow, um, that is the number one source of aggravation, irritation, frustration on a golf course. Um, you know, so it's important who you, if you really want to get your best out of golf, you need to be mindful of who are you playing with? <laughs> you know, when are you playing and um, and, and be aware if it's bothering you how to create a bubble around you so it doesn't, it doesn't bother you. But, but these little things, just the big dynamic between extroverts and introverts and the patients versus the urgency, responsible probably for 90% of the dissatisfaction, disappointment, unmet expectations when amateurs play golf. And touring pros too. Same thing. This is some good information tonight, huh, Darren? This is, Absolutely. I, yeah. to, I told you. I told you. I told you. Now, here's, here's this question. Here's the question coming from. Uh, we don't mess around here. Uh, Darren brought in Dr. McCabe. You know him by any chance? I heard of him. Yeah. Now, yeah. He he was terrific too. He was really good. Uh, have you studied or used Myers Briggs? I'm an NTP. What kind of golfer am I? Uh, did he say an ENTP? ENTP. Or ENTP. Okay. So that would be um, that would be a combination of the challenger and the um, on the social, I believe. Now I take in Myers Briggs a bunch of times, and I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but I want to tell you the difference in in the profile I use at Eagle Vision and also my golf mind. When you take a uh, profile like Myers-Briggs or DISC or Predictive Index or all those popular ones that have been around a long time, um, you are, you, you're, it's a cognitive kind of thing. You're asked, would you rather do this? Would you rather do that? Do you prefer this? Do you prefer that? Or you rank certain things. All of those instruments are not really validated instruments. And the reason for it is as your experience changes or your situation changes, um, your answers may change, and so therefore your profile may change. So I've taken Myers Briggs, I don't know, seven or eight times for different you know, reasons, different companies, and so forth. And I have always been an ENTJ or an ENTP or an ENTJ or an ENTP. So, but I'm not. I am not a 
a J, <laughs> you know. So, but the point of it is it changes because of what's going on in my environment. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's fabulous. It's, it's a wonderful instrument. However, um, the ones that I use are what we call statistical, and they're really based, uh, developed on how the brain responds to a stimulus. So when you look at this adjective, your brain has an immediate response to that adjective. It either has, feels good about it, has an affinity for it, or it doesn't like it. Say the word aggressive, right? So if you have the word aggressive and you're asked one to five, are you five, yes, aggressive, or one, no aggressive, or in the middle or whatever, your brain has a judgment about that word. And that assessment that that um, judgment about that word is going to impact how you behave and so that never changes from the time you are born to the time you're gone um, your basic feeling about aggressiveness is going to remain pretty much the same um, so you're either indifferent to it or you think it's terrible, or you think it's great, or you think there's sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So the, the PDP that I use and the Golf Mind RX are based on the brain's responses. So you don't even have to know how to define that word. You just, when you answer it, your brain is responding for you. So for that reason, um, profile kind of stays the same through your whole life. What will change is the stressors around you, the um, circumstances around you. But it, when you see your profile, you get um, you get a basic natural self, which is where you're always going to be pretty much. Then you get the stressors, what's happening to you lately, and then you get how you come across others because of that. So the, the question a little while ago, you can behave in a way that is very unnatural and unlike you, but it won't be good for you. It'll be, it'll be hard. You know what we call we call that work. It's work. If if Peter Jacobson has to rein in his personality to play with Raymond Floyd, for instance, that's work to do that. It's not natural for him. You see. So whenever you are working at how you behave, you are losing all of your fabulous natural instinct and all of your your gifts and your skills and your talents. Um, Carl Jung said the goal of personality is wholeness, wholeness with a W. And he said the more you can operate, understand yourself and operate in your area of self-awareness and who you are, the happier, more contented, more successful you will be. So we spend day, we, you know, I, every profile I look at pretty much I see a lot of stressors because maybe somebody has a bad boss, or maybe they have a grumpy spouse, or maybe they have a, a mother-in-law that's driving them crazy. And you'll see them trying to adapt this behavior. Oh, I'm not going to let this bother me. I'll keep this in. Well, when you keep that in, that's called work. And that work takes energy. And it drains your satisfaction. And it drains your energy over time. So there's really no good reason to do it. Well, I think I made a mistake here. I think he said that his letters were ENTP. I think it's I D I O T. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's, who, I got another here. Somebody else says here maybe Jennifer needs to be hired to help put the teams together for the U.S. Ryder Cup. You, you, well, you, let me tell movies. you a secret. Let me tell you, I, I, um, Paul Azinger, uh, my work with the Solheim Cup was. Um, maximizing chemistry and compatibility, minimizing hostility and anxiety. So that's what I did. I, I, I had a lot to do with who played with whom and what order and all that stuff. So anyway, Azinger did something very similar. And wasn't he a fabulous success? And then, and then the other captains, um, I talked to a couple of them. Other people talked to them. And they all said, just like last year, um, which was horrible, they all said, oh, these guys are professionals, and we're not going to tell them what to do. And, and they, those professionals do not understand this stuff any better than anybody else does. But anyway, I asked Julie Inkster, who was fabulous captain. I asked her in 2016 and then, and then this year. I said, Julie, 
Did anybody from the Ryder Cup team ever call you and ask you, could you help them? Could you make some suggestions? She said, are you kidding me? She said, those guys would never call me and ask me. Um, so, you know, it's terrible. It's embarrassing that they didn't. But, you know, <laughs> the thing of it is, uh, some people, you, you know, I'll tell you, this is people you just can't tell them anything because, like they say, they are professionals, they know everything, they've done it all this time, and they just don't think there's anything you can tell them. That's just, think about all the instructors that students go to, they go year after year and they never get better, and the instructor says, well, I guess you just didn't do what I told you. You know, the instructor doesn't even, you don't even, they're not even accountable for it. I mean, I've had instructors, not long, but, you know, um, we hired, we had, and then we fired, but, you know, I hear them say all the time, you know, I've told him what to do. If he doesn't get any better, it's not my fault. Well, we think it is your fault, <laughs> you know, either figure out how to teach this guy or tell him to get another instructor. Yeah, that's one of the things oh. I always do, and I know Darren's the same way. I ask a lot of questions. As soon as the person comes up, I don't mm -hmm. have, I don't have them hit balls immediately. I want them to to talk so then I can figure out who they are. Mm hmm And what they want. What do they want? You know, it's like um, when you, you know, when you have a traditional instructor, they have a traditional, they start here, they start here, they start here, they start here. Well, if a guy shows up with a $650 driver, he does not want to start with a seven iron. He doesn't. So if you can't teach him to hit the driver, then get an instructor who can, but once he learns to hit that driver, he'll come back and learn everything else. But if he can't hit that driver, he's not, he's not going to have any uh, respect for the instructor. Who's got a question? Anybody got a question? I got the microphones all open. Anybody? How about you, Artie? Go ahead. I, uh, so I went through this uh, two-day training at work. Uh, you know, basically we we got the red, green, yellow, blue. Uh, mm -hmm. So I I really do agree 100% uh, with what you're saying, Debbie. It's uh, fascinating. I never, until you brought it up, I never would have thought that applied to golf and to well, how I golf and how to how I approach things. So it's uh, very interesting. Uh, that you brought this up well, and yeah well your personality goes with you out there you know right <laughs> so, <laughs> um uh so it, you don't leave it behind and and the thing is when when you say well why do i play golf right um i ask people all the time why do you play golf and they a lot of times they say i play to relax well i don't know many people relax when they're playing golf number one because they're playing with the wrong people to relax uh, or they play at the wrong time of day or, or whatever. Um, but um, when you, you know, and some people say I play to have fun and, um, and they have fun, but if like in, uh, Lee Trevino or Peter Jacobson's or Matt Kuchar's, um, you know, saying if they're, if they're not having fun because everybody around them is grumpy and grouchy and, um, and having a bad day and throwing their clubs and, and whining and carrying on, that, that sucks the energy out of a person who plays for fun. That's why the chilling pros who have that personality always say, I play so much better with my friends. And, and I work with them to recreate the same feeling when they're playing between, you know, on a competitive round as they have with their friends. You know, I work with them to, to keep them in that state. And, and by the way, um, I'm, I have a, a philosophy, and you've got to remember, I didn't start playing golf until 1995, um, and I get to play like once or twice a week sometimes. I, I'm still addicted to it, but, you know, people always say it's just so hard to concentrate, you know, for 18 holes, you know, four hours, whatever, and I said, you don't have to concentrate for four hours. You have to concentrate for about four minutes, and that's what happens right before you address the ball through the time the club face hits the ball and it's gone. That's the only time you really have to take control and be in control of who you are. And anybody can manage four minutes, right? 
Well, it's like uh, Chick Harbert used to tell me about uh, Darren's old boss. He said the reason why Nicholas was better than everybody else, he could play all 18 holes. And mm -hmm. it, a lot of guys can't play 18 holes. They play 16 holes. They've got two holes that are just, <laughs> for lack of a better term, yeah. a brain fart. They can't control their minds, and they can't well, stay let focused. You, let, let me give you an example of something that happens there, okay? Um, I, have a, I have a professional golfer who really is a good golfer. Everybody says he's a good golfer. He's on the Champions Tour now. But anyway, um, when, he, when he was on the tour, he couldn't make the cut. And, he could, and I watched, I don't know how many times, six, seven, eight times, he would be leading by three or four strokes coming in, um, you'd think, my goodness, he's going to make it. This is great. He's going to play the weekend. And he would do something, double bogey, triple bogey, whatever, and miss the cut. And he did this for off and on for months and months, over a couple of years. Oh, look, so I got to know him. It turns out that he was a social golfer, you know, um, who played to have fun. But I spent the day with him one day, and he was, and this is, this is just, this is the kind of thing people have to get in touch with. He, um, he went to Catholic school, and he was the biggest boy in the, in the class. And he was very good athletically, and he always dominated in basketball and volleyball and baseball and all this kind of stuff. So every time he had a really good game, his nun, his teacher, would come up and tell him, that if he didn't watch out, if he got too proud, if he got too excited, if he got too happy, that God was going to punish him. So anyway, so he got to this place that he had in his mind, he could see, now here he is in his um, 40s, early 40s at this point, and he would see himself coming in, in the lead, and he would have this scary feeling that if he won, God would hurt his kids or his family. And it wasn't rallied at the top of his head, but it was just this clenching thought that tightened him up because he thought that this was, this was going to be something bad. So, so we had a technique where, you know, we, my technique really is basically at the point that you're addressing the ball. So I told him that when he set the club face down, he would take a deep breath in and out, and he would say, up your sister Eugenia. <laughs> and then he, and he would hit the ball. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, he did quite well. And, 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 <laughs> and you gave him this advice. Calls me up and he says, Jennifer, I'm feeling so guilty about saying that. To the nun, I said, My gosh, she's been dead for 30 years. You know, and I said, I'll you something else. I said, If she's looking down, I, I have a time this. I said, If she's looking down on you, she is so sorry for what she did to you when you were a little boy. Let me tell you something. She's, she probably, she, she's probably looking up. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably looking up after what she did to a This ruined the golf game forever. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I guess I I think she probably is. But but you see, those are the kind of things that people don't think have anything to do with what what they do in the golf course. They think I'm not. I don't have anything like that bothering me. You know. Um. So I got. Can I tell you a story about a guy and his wife? You know, who Go. they didn't play golf very much together. Because this is another, if people just don't realize what's going on in their heads. But anyway, he was a, a chief executive with a very big company and he, lots and lots and lots of customer golf, lots and lots and lots and big games and big bucks, you know, every weekend. And his wife was complaining. Um, he was a, um, a challenger golfer and she was a traditional golfer. Um, but she didn't want anybody behind her and she didn't want anybody in front of her. 
and she just wanted to have his undivided attention. So she wanted to play golf to have his undivided attention. Never occurred to him what that meant. So anyway, he said, you know, we haven't played golf. I'll take you out on Sunday afternoon. And, um, and this is a really fabulous resort where he happened to, you know, own a big chunk of it. So, so he said, we'll go out and there won't be anybody behind us and nobody in front of us and just be you and I. We'll go out and we'll take our time and we'll play golf. And so he's a challenger, right? So um, he, what is his thing about winning? He has to win. He has to have goals. And she is, I just want to be, have your undivided attention, be with you, you know, um, nice, calm, peaceful, look at the flowers and so forth. So anyway, they played 17 holes. They were you know, coming up on the 17th green. And he had decided nobody was behind him. He'd play two balls. So they get to the 17th hole and his approach shot, first one is about four inches from the cup. And then he pulls the second one into the woods on the left and he throws his club down. He's so upset because he pulled that shot. And she said, honey, I don't know why you're so upset. You know, you're right up there by the pin. He said, yes, but I'm already down one to that ball. So it dawned on her, he wasn't playing with her. So she said, well, you're just playing with your imaginary friend. You're not playing with me. So she <laughs> got in the cart. I'm not going to say a thing. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and she went in. She, she took the cart and left him out there with a wedge and a feather to play 18. <laughs> but these people play golf for different reasons, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know what you boys are thinking. It was an imaginary friend, not a real friend. No, I tell you what, it's 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 amazing. Oh, it's but there, I, I, I've heard that one. I don't know how many times. You're not playing with me. <laughs> yeah, but see, but he did. It never occurred to him. <laughs> That there would be another reason to play except to win something, right? Yeah, my so, only my only problem is I told to say and say I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so don't come out next time. We don't want you to play with us anyway. <laughs> we were fine by ourselves. I wonder what color is yeah. my. What well, if you do an analysis on me? What's my color? Black. <laughs> yours, Bobby? Yeah. I think yours. <laughs> I, think I tell you what, you take that one guy that had the problem with the nun and said, give me that ruler she had, whack him up the side head, say, snap out of it. <laughs> going to be broke the rest of your life, you bonehead. Okay, what, anybody else got a question? <laughs> what about you, Artie? You got a question, anybody? If not, we'll call it a night. I mean, Oh, yeah, you, you, you kind of uh, touched on it there. What color would you rate Bobby? Well, I know Bobby, so I did his. And um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, first of all, I know you don't realize this, but he, but he has a very intense profile. In other words, you know, how far <laughs> from the line uh, has a lot to do with things, too. So it's kind of like what you see is what you get, right? You, you don't have to be around him for more than about 10 seconds. You can kind of figure him out. Right? <laughs> um, other people... <laughs> Other people, it takes you a while. You kind of have to watch them a while, listen, talk to them. So anyway, Bobby is a combination of the social and the challenger, and he is. Um, it's, his traits are quite um, separated, the two above, the dominance and extroversion, and the way below, um, impatient and uh, nonconformist. <laughs> uh, no conformity, no... Hates rules, hates process, hates systems, uh, has no patience whatsoever, moves fast, thinks fast, idea a minute kind of person. Oh, you do know him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Did you have to put him in a hospital to get that out? <laughs> <laughs> lock the door. Oh. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, like I said, it's what you see is what you get. I mean, it's big. It's a big personality, you know, it's like um, <laughs> there's really no mistaking it. 
I still love well, it. Were well, you not playing with me? You're just playing with yourself with your phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, here comes. <laughs> I'm gonna smack you with a wedge. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you to Brazil on a nice vacation. Just push you over the wrench. <laughs> Boom! That happens. Uh, that happens. That happens. Well, I'll tell you what, Jennifer, you are wonderful. You are absolutely wonderful. I'll tell you, you get A+. Yeah. Plus, and uh, we're going to oh, load this up thanks. and remind everybody, if they want to get a profile, just go to golfmindrx.com. Yeah, and please remember, if you take the profile, I don't charge another thing. Um, to talk to you on the phone and go over it with you, make sure you understand it, that you get all the goodies out of it, and give you some specific things, practice to do while we're talking on the phone, to go out and do, and then call me back and tell me how it goes. And um, because I am addicted to, um, to, I'm addicted to profiling. Number one, I'm addicted to golf. I love golf, and I, the reason I wrote the profile really was. I went out with all these captains of industry and people are supposed to be able to run this and run that and run this. And they couldn't master themselves on the golf course. And they would be, they'd pay $10,000 for a pro-am and knew this and knew that and knew this. And they go out and whip the ball on the first tee and they're, they're devastated and, you know, they're demoralized. And I thought golf should be fun people. I mean, you know, you shouldn't make it, uh, you know, it's not a masochistic experience. And so I really wrote the profile so people would have their best experience every time they play. And um, I can't turn somebody in from a, a 35 to a two because I don't teach the golf swing. But I can help people master their own responses every time they play so they get the most out of every chance they get. And, um, and I'm evangelistic about that. So... Glad to talk to anybody. And, and the name of the book again is? Personality Matters. Personality Matters. You can um, get it on, on Amazon. Amazon, iTunes, Kindle, Audible. Yeah. All right. You had yeah. anything else, Darren? Love you. No, that, was, that was awesome information. Thanks so much for your time. Well, nice right. talking to you all. And um, thank you so much for inviting me, Bobby. That was fun. You know how much I love to talk about this stuff. So. And well, you, we always have fun. You're the best. Thank you, Jennifer. You're the best. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.